to the Cougar Tailgate, where BYU fandom lives. Here's your hosts, Jason Shepard and Lauren Klain. What's up, Cougar fans? BYU is undefeated, ranked 15th in the country, and it's a beautiful game day. How can I not be in a really, really good mood? Every Saturday on Cougar Tailgate, we want to help you become the ultimate fan by getting to know the opponent and giving you an in-depth look behind the scenes into what makes game day such a fantastic day. I'm Lauren McLean. And I'm Jason Shepard. You're right. This has been a very unique year to do a show about the fan experience because, let's be honest, the fan experience hasn't existed like we are used to having it. We celebrated 150 years last year, and the 151st has been uh, certainly one for the books. Certainly it's going to be a year that we will never forget, and it's not because of good things, unfortunately, for the most part. Although some really good things are happening with BYU football right now, and we'll, uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, today we're talking to BYU Athletics man in charge of marketing and promotions, David Almodova, to get to know how his team has kept the hype going with the fans even when they aren't allowed in the stadium. He'll join the show coming up a little bit later on. And today's game is another fanless one in Lavelle Edwards Stadium against the University of Texas San Antonio. We'll learn more about the Roadrunners, its history and traditions, later on with Associate Athletic Director Stephanie Cisneros. Yeah, since we were on last, BYU has played and won two games, no surprise. Uh, they beat Troy 48-7, to squeaked that one out, didn't they? And then last week... They beat uh, the Louisiana Tech Bulldogs in the uh, Carmelone Bowl. I just named it that. That actually wasn't what it was called. Uh, <laughs> but it should have been. It should have been. I think it's a good name. I'm 40. loving these numbers in the 40s. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, as long as it's BYU in the 40s, yeah, not exactly, the opposition. Exactly. But that's certainly what we've seen. 45-14 was the final score. Zach Wilson just continues to rack up insane numbers. In fact, he's only he only threw two incomplete passes. The guy right now has a completion percentage of 85%. That is insane. That's, that's that does not happen. It's crazy. He was also responsible for five touchdowns in that game. Two through the air, three on the ground. You may remember a couple of uh, notable performances. Number one, uh, 96, Carter Wheat gets his first touchdown, something obviously he'll always remember. And he was stoked about he it. He was stoked. And that was a great <laughs> pass into the corner oh, of the end gorgeous. zone uh, from Zach Wilson. And how about Mason Wake making headlines by literally running over dudes before ultimately <laughs> going he, to the ground? You know, he looked like Cosmo bowling down the stands, but on the field. That's right. Yeah, and, and in that the is, bowling ball. That is a good tease because we may talk about that coming up uh, yes. in, in a little bit. The game, surprisingly was tied 7-7 after the first quarter, but from that point on, BYU just completely dominated, as you would expect. They ended up rolling, and, and again, final score 45-14. to uh, to 14. And that brings us to this week's opponent in the University of Texas at San Antonio, but I actually think they prefer, Lauren, to be called UTSA. I mean, I would, because the University of Texas San Antonio is just kind of a mouthful. It, it, is, it is long. They are the roadrunners, so immediately, yes. what do you think of? Uh, meep, meep. Yeah, Looney Tunes, <laughs> of course. I'm sure they're so sick of that. They're like, come on, the guys yeah. that go there. Look, the here's the deal. Team. If you don't want don't the meet, meet comparison, don't nickname yourself the Roadrunners. <laughs> it's so true. And this is the first ever meeting between BYU and UTSA. So it should it should be a fun game. UTSA is 3-1. and one. They were 3-0 and oh to start the year before losing to UAB last week. So the Roadrunners, here's some interesting information about them. Forced turnovers and are currently tied for first in the country with seven interceptions on the year. However, they have given up more passing plays of 20-plus yards than any other team in the country. What? That's, that's, what? That is not a good recipe for them no. because BYU is throwing the ball all over the field. Yeah, because you, 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 know, you, you read the first thing about them being you know one of the best in the country with turnovers. You're like, oh my gosh, great team! <laughs> However, listen to this. Giving it more, yeah, because BYU loves those big plays. Like they, they feed off of that, right? So and and this year with guys like Gunnar Romney, Dax Milne, BYU has always wanted to be that down the field, you know, stretch the stretch the field and and throw deep balls, and it, it hasn't always worked out. This year it's working out. You have a an unbelievable quarterback in Zach Wilson, and then Gunnar and Dax and and everybody. They're doing a fantastic job of getting down the field, using their speed, and then making phenomenal catches. Oh, yeah. Gunnar Romney has three consecutive games of 100 yards receiving. That has not happened for a BYU receiver since 2012 with Cody Hoffman. Wow. It has been that long since BYU. And so it's not just three in a row. He started the year that way. Yeah. 100 yard receiving, 100 yards, 100 yards in the first three games. And it helps that the matchups aren't 
great for them. You know what I'm right. saying? I mean, they are great for BYU. The matchups have been great for Gunnar Romney. He's he definitely has the edge over all of them. So it'll it'll be interesting to see when we you know we've talked about this before when we get to Boise State and San Diego State when they're a little bit better matchups to see if they can continue making these incredible catches, which which he's a talented, talented guy. The receivers have been really great, and obviously Zach Wilson has been on the money. So I feel like they they can continue to do that, and also the run game right. has been phenomenal. We already we already mentioned Wake, who literally bulldozed <laughs> his way, and he was someone. Was that the first time we saw him in no, this we, game? Um, no, we've seen him previously, but certainly nothing. It's just the first time that, he's made some waves. The, that yes, Wake waves. Uh, Hey! Did you even mean to do that? I didn't. You should take I, credit for that. Well, I, I mean, I did mean to. That's what, it's exactly what I meant. You meant to do it, it yes. It sounded right. It really did. And then you have uh, Lopini Katoa and... Uh, Tyler Algier. Tyler Algier. They, and they've been phenomenal. They've been really good. They didn't even... Really, they didn't need to use them very much against LA Tech because they were throwing the ball and, yeah. and uh, having a lot of success through the air. But and I think that's going to be something we're going to be seeing is is more opportunities for these running backs. And they've been... Really, really good for BYU. You know, this week's matchup with uh, UTSA, not that they are extremely prolific in terms of yardage and scoring and things like that. This will be by far the most balanced offensive attack that BYU has faced. And by that, I mean in terms of distribution of run and pass. Mm -hmm. You know, so far, BYU's faced teams that they're uh, they're either a passing team or a running team. The Roadrunners actually they have a good balance. They have a good balance and actually do as much right around a little over 200 yards a game for each. So that, that'll be a little different wrinkle than what we're used to is you can, maybe can't zero in on, on the passing attack or the running game. So it'll be something. And they've got, by the way, fantastic name for their tailback. His name is Sincere. Sincere McCormick. Yes. His name is Sincere. How about yes that? That's that cool, name. right? That's a really cool name. Yeah, and he's, and he's, he's really good, too. The, the coaches have talked a lot about the size of this team in terms of, like, at the scope position, that they're big and physical. They've got, they've got big back, mm-hmm. big receivers, big tight ends. Now, again, talent-wise, BYU's right. is going to have the, the, the better talent. But, I, I but think it's this, still something they haven't seen. Yes. And even, but here's the thing. We're, we're, we're talking about UTSA, like, you know, this, this may be the biggest challenge. This is also the biggest uh, – mar- this is the biggest – Point differential uh-huh. because BYU is favored by five touchdowns. They're, they're favored by thirty-five points in this game, so it's the most they've been favored Poison. by any game. Poison. I know Eric, Eric Mateos. <laughs> Eric Mateos is not <laughs> wanting to hear anything about a five touchdown. Uh, oh, advantage I in love this that game. guy. I love that. I would do that as a coach too. I'd be like, do not listen to any of this. Uh, you don't want it to get in their heads. No, but for the program, it's fantastic. No, it is the, great for, for the, the fans. Great yes. for the program. Yeah, great for recruiting. It's, it's just great all around. Did but you, yes, did you happen to hear the Roadrunners head coach Jeff Trailer? <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. When he was asked about oh, what he saw he from BYU, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the best reactions <laughs> ever. I laughed so hard with his thick Southern accent. Oh yeah. As you know, I like a good Southern accent. But he's great. But uh, I I love that. And yeah, he basically just mentioned every position on BYU's yeah. team as being dominant, and and he said, well, hopefully we can. He didn't say lucky. He said he didn't say hopefully we can be lucky. But that's basically what he was insinuating towards the end of that yeah, he, that clip. Like I, it's going to be a good experience, and maybe we'll get lucky. I interviewed him this week for pregame, which I always interview the opposing coach, and. Usually, I'll throughout the conversation, I'll ask them, is this the first time you've been out here? Sometimes I ask before, and then I can ask a question specific to whether they have or have not. And um, so throughout the conversation, I asked them about coming out here and the experience. I said, because I'm, ass- I'm assuming, or that you told me you'd never been out here. And I said, I'm assuming that most of your players have never been out this direction. How much are you excited to be able to give them that kind of experience to be in this environment and maybe see mountains for the first time? So he told a really funny story. <laughs> He's like, I grew up in this, this little town in Texas. And I said, he actually had several friends from this small town in Texas that ended up going to BYU. So what? he said, they always talked about how... 
They loved BYU. So it was always on my radar. And they would always tell me how beautiful it is. So I always wanted to come out here and play. So when my AD asked me if you want to play BYU, he's like, absolutely. He's like, little did I know they were going to be the 15th best team in the country. <laughs> Maybe we should have put this off for a year or so. <laughs> this isn't going to be as fun as <laughs> yeah, I originally thought it was exactly. going to be. Exactly. He was, he was great about it. And you're right with the Southern accent. It just adds something to it. They, some, I feel like if someone has a thick Southern accent, they can say something that's not actually funny and I will laugh. It probably makes it awkward because they're like, I wasn't trying to make a joke. Well, no. and, and they <laughs> I love it. And they don't think they have an accent because that's just what everybody yeah. sounds like. We probably have an accent to them. I know. It's true. It's true. Coming up, we're going to actually learn a little bit more about UTSA and the Roadrunners when we talk to Stephanie Cisnero. She's the Associate Athletic Director for the Roadrunners. So don't go anywhere. This is Cougar Tailgate. Did you know former Jazz, Spurs, and Hornets guard Devin Brown played his college ball at UTSA? Welcome back into the Cougar Tailgate. I'm Lauren McLean. And I'm Jason Shepard. There's a tradition and pride in every college football program across America. This is only the 10th year of football for UTSA, but they've already become one of the fastest schools to reach a bowl game, and they had a first-round NFL draft pick. That's pretty impressive. To help us learn more about the Roadrunners, we have Associate Athletic Director Stephanie Cisneros on the line. Stephanie, first of all, thank you so much for joining us here on Cougar Tailgate. Thank you for having me. So, uh, so give everybody an idea about what your job entails, how long you've been at UTSA, and just a little bit about you and, and your job description. No, absolutely. Uh, my journey with UTSA actually started back in the late 90s. Um, I started as a freshman at UTSA in uh, fall of 97, um, graduated with my first degree there um, in 2001, Decided that wasn't enough um, and went back for more, got a master's degree. At the same time, I was actually working there full time in the career center um, under our student affairs division. Um, And that actually, that experience offered me the opportunity to start working with our student athletes um, back in about 2006, 2007 um, as a career counselor, which was an amazing journey um, in and of itself. And then had the opportunity to transition that role into formally into the athletic department. Um, and have been officially with athletics um, since 2016. Um, so my role actually within athletics is really focused in on student athlete development. Um, I work with our um, professional, our leadership program, our professional development, um, focusing in on those elements, um, helping our, our student athletes in those areas. Wow, there there must be something special about UTSA if you decided to stick around that long since the the late '90s. That's fantastic, and and like we mentioned, the football program's only been around for the first ten years. Is there a specific game yeah. or moment that stands out to you in those first ten years of Roadrunner football? Goodness, aside from that very first game, I mean, there's there's a lot. There's there's truly a lot. Um, you know, from being a student there when we didn't have football, when it was kind of the um, we had a T-shirt for years um, that was, you know, still undefeated in football. And um, we wore that for years um, coming up upon our, our first season. And, um, you know, that first game was absolutely amazing. To be in the Alamo Dome with 56,000 fans, um, it, it was just, I had tears. At the moment that we kicked off, I mean, just tears flowing from my eyes. Um, and it was just amazing to see. So that was probably, uh, you know, number one. And then I would say close after was um, when we won that game um, to be able to know that we were eligible for a bowl game. And that year um, when we went to the bowl game, that was just an amazing feeling to know that so quickly we were able to accomplish that goal. What did it mean to the school? Because, you know, obviously 10 years is not a not a long period of time to be a program. When you think of, you know, some of these other college football programs that have been around for so long what what was that like to be on campus as when you knew that this was starting and that you guys were going to have an FBS football team on campus I have to imagine there was a lot of excitement when it when a program can can start building towards something like that yeah, you're absolutely right um the excitement was it, it was it was astonishing to see the um excitement of students on campus behind 
um, getting football on campus and our alumni base, um, you know, coming back and engaging. Um, it, it was amazing um, to see that happen. Um, I, you know, when I was in school, um, they referred to the school as a commuter school. That was, hmm. that was kind of the way that we were looked at back in the late 90s. We only had about 17, 18,000 students at that time. Um, so a still a significantly large, a pretty decent-sized school, um, but we had a lot of individuals that would walk around campus um, with other school shirts on. So they would wear other school gears, and, you know, for those of us that were kind of already looped in with athletics and going to the games, you know, we, we wanted that to change. Um, and so as we had that um, discussion about football, you could see that change, that, uh, that pride, that spirit start to change. Um, Texas is um, a football state. I mean, we love our football in Texas. So to be a, um, a college in San Antonio, being such a large um, school, you know, it, 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 football made a difference for us. Um, and it really kind of changed the trajectory of where our athletic department was going and how we were really seen um, in addition to the growth, continual growth of the campus in general. There really is something about football. I love that the students were like, ah, now that we have a football team, I guess I'll start wearing the shirt. Yeah, it does change things. There's no question. <laughs> no, it definitely does. And with with the program only being around for a decade, who has developed into the school's biggest rival on the field? Oh, that's a that's a, a good question. You know, we've um, there's definitely still a rivalry that dates back to our Southwest Conference days that you know, started way before we even had football. Um, you know, Texas State, is it's still a big game for us um, in terms of, um, you know, being on the field and just the, the banter back and forth. And um, they're just right up the road from us. So I, I would definitely say that that probably still um, holds true. Um, within our conference, um, you know, I would be, I would say probably like a rice um, would be one of the ones that would be close to a rival for us. Um, they're you know just down the road in Houston, so it's a it's a close trip for us. Um, so I would say just within conference, that's probably one of them. A lot of people that may not necessarily know a lot about college sports or some of the traditions. A lot of people certainly are going to know Texas and Hook'em Horns. You guys have birds up, and I and I was interviewing Coach Trailer this week for for pregame, and he ended the interview with birds up, and so. What are some of the other unique traditions or um, things like that that are around the athletics program? What what other traditions have you guys created or maybe are in the process of of trying to create? Absolutely. I think that um, that's, you know, something that it gives us a unique um, edge in terms of being able to create and being such a young university and, and really developing our own identity within um, the landscape of our um, our athletics and um, Birds Up is definitely number one. That's, um, you know, that, that's definitely our, our number one tradition. It's, not, um, it's something that we use the hashtag and whatnot. Um, I would also say that um, kind of our chant um, of UT, um, one side um, or one group of individuals or even an individual fan yelling UT, um, and then following that very loudly with an essay, so making it very clear that it's San Antonio. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that that's definitely become a, a tradition um, as well. Um, I think one of my favorite ones, um, favorite traditions that started back when we first uh, started the team in terms of football-specific traditions is our spirit walk. And unfortunately, because of the times that we're in right now with the pandemic, we, we haven't been able to have that this year. But, um, it, you know, in a normal normal year, that's one of my favorite things. The um, football team unloads the bus, walks down this walkway. Uh, the band is lined up. The fans are lined up. The cheerleaders, the dance team. And it's just full of spirit and pride. Um, and it's a lot of fun to see the guys and kind of um, cheer for them as they're walking in to, to go onto the field. I love that. I think that's something football players are missing out on this year uh, with everything going on. But honestly, so what we know most about Roadrunners comes from Looney Tunes. You guys probably get that you're all the time. You're probably sick of that reference all the time. I'm sure you are. <laughs> I'm sure you're so sick of that. But what's the story behind the Roadrunners? No, absolutely. Um, so we actually um, went to vote 
in 77, I believe it was, um, the school was, again, still young. Um, we're, we're only 51 years young. So we're, as a, as a school, we're, we're very young. Um, but in 1977, the student body and the student government actually took it to a vote. We needed a, a mascot. And so they chose the, um, the Roadrunners. And it was up against armadillos. From, um, from what I understand, it was the armadillos <laughs> or the Roadrunners. Roadrunners wow. came out on top. I'm, I'm really glad that Roadrunners came out on top of that. Over armadillos. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but, the, you know, soon thereafter, they started referring to the Roadrunner as Rowdy. And so we are actually Rowdy um, is the name of our mascot. Um, and, of course, you get the, um, the beep beep. You'll hear the occasional, you know, beep beep, or you'll see it on shirts. Um, but you also just that quickness and that um, community. And if you think of a, a group of roadrunners coming together, um, you know, as community, if you look at that bird just in general and how they operate within their own group, um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's remarkable to kind of see um, how it really fits for our university. A bunch of Looney Tune fans back in '77. Absolutely, absolutely. It's probably it was probably honestly one of the heydays of Looney I Tunes know, as well. It probably really was. Stephanie Cisneros, sure. associate AD for UTSA, joining us here on Cougar Tailgate. So, just for clarification, and I've even seen it in the game notes, do you guys prefer UTSA to University of Texas at San Antonio? Is do you prefer I, always saying UTSA for the most part? UTSA is definitely preferred. I think the thing that we want to stay away from is like UT San Antonio. Gotcha. Um, But UTSA is certainly preferred. Gotcha. Very nice. Okay. So as we've mentioned, it's in San Antonio. So, and and this is a little different than some of the other, you know, college football programs, because a lot of these college football programs come from smaller areas, smaller towns, but, you know, San Antonio is a, a, a major metropolitan city, so it's a little different, and I actually think it's pretty cool that you have that in, in a bigger city like that. So let's talk a little bit about San Antonio. Things obviously we know about San Antonio, obviously the Alamo. Uh, as a jazz fan, I'm certainly well familiar with the San Antonio Spurs. Um, you know, the Riverwalk. What, what else is... If somebody has never been to San Antonio, which I have never been, get, give us an idea of, of what it's like to experience San Antonio. Oh, absolutely. The, the culture is so rich here. Um, I think one of the things, if you were to go into the downtown area just in general um, and experience even the, the river walk, um, you'll, you'll get a sense of that, that culture. Um, it's Hispanic Heritage Month right now. Um, and you get that rich sense of, of Hispanic culture being ingrained in a lot of the things within the city. Um, and you'll, good Mexican food, I will say that um, that's probably one of my favorite things. Um, and just good food all around. But um, I think that one of my favorite things is uh, some of the amazing restaurants that we have. Um, there's, there's so much to do in San Antonio. Um, you know, we've got Fiesta, Texas. So we have a Six Flags here, um, which is a lot of fun to go to. Um, we've got um, just a lot of experiences that people can can have when they come into town, whether depending on which side of town they're staying on. Um, so there's, you'll get a sense of that that kind of tradition, that rich cultural identity of this town if you were to come and stay um, in San Antonio. You, I, I, I'm sorry, Stephanie. I stopped listening after you said food and restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I'm all about the food, so so count me in. I'll, I'll head over to San Antonio. So you guys have had some NFL guys, NBA guys. What are some of the most notable alumni from UTSA? You know, the the first person I think of is, of course, Marcus Davenport. Um, when I think of notable alumni, um, I was fortunate enough to get to know Marcus um, while he was a student athlete and phenomenal young man. Um, he's doing well with the Saints. Um, so definitely Marcus. Um, you've probably uh, possibly heard of Justin Anderson um, yep. with the Angels. Um, he pitched for us, um, went on to be – um, drafted by the Angels and then made his major league debut, I believe, in 2018. I believe it was. So um, he's, you know, a different sport. Um, probably a really cool story. Um, also, football wise, uh, Teddy Williams was um, actually a track student athlete for us. And he ran for us before we even had football. He graduated before we had our football team. And um, was able to actually um, 
sign a deal and, and go on to play several years of, of professional football. He was with the Cowboys, with the Colts. Um, I think he um, most recently was with the Panthers. So he's another one. And sorry, I, I keep thinking of, of sports-related ones. Hey, there's um, nothing wrong with that. We, we don't have an issue with that. <laughs> As uh, you're probably familiar with Michelle Beadle, mm-hmm. um, she's from this area, um, finished her degree, um, graduated from UC, um, and of course went on with ESPN and was on several shows. Um, so, you know, looking at that sports journalism side, um, are you familiar with uh, Percy Jackson? Yes. The, the book. The yes. book? You are? I, was yes. like, I was like, a person or the book? Because definitely familiar <laughs> with the book. With the lightning thief. Okay, so um, I didn't know this um, until my daughter pointed it out to me. She's a huge Rick Reardon fan. Um, And she said, Mom, his Wikipedia actually says he went to UTSA. He got his teaching certificate um, from UTSA. So he went and got some teaching certificates from us. And then, of course, after teaching has gone on and, and, you know, written multiple books, is still um, writing books. And so that's another one that I actually, my daughter pointed out to me. So, um, you know, those are some ones just off the top of my head that I can think of. Stephanie, thank you so much for taking a few minutes with us today. We really appreciate it. Fantastic information. It was a lot of fun talking to you, and, and thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Absolutely. My pleasure. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. That's Stephanie Cisneros, Associate AD for UTSA Athletics. I appreciate her taking a few minutes today. And coming up next, we'll talk Zach Wilson, college football stadiums, and how we feel about the Navy jerseys for homecoming. This is Cougar Tailgate. Did you know, outside the sports world, UTSA is also where Travis Scott started his education before pursuing a music career. the Cougar Tailgate. My name is Jason Shepard alongside Lauren McLean. What's up? So, Zach Wilson, um, how do we say this? Is having a decent season? Uh, would decent that be fair is not, to say? Decent is not the correct word. <laughs> that is not Shep, the correct that's word. That's not the word I would use. He is unbelievable right now. Look, he is garnering so much attention. I don't even know if you saw this or heard about this. So, the, the guys doing the ESPN game um, for BYU and Texas San Antonio. Um, the guy that's doing the play-by-play of this game is Anish Shroff from ESPN. Uh-huh. And he tweeted something out the other day that blew my mind. And, and I think this goes to show you the level of appreciation from the national media. So Anish said that the jump that he has seen on the film he's watched of Zach Wilson from last year to this year He compares it to what we saw in the senior season of Joe Burrow for LSU. He said that that is comparable to what he saw in the jump that Joe Burrow took from the year before to the year he ended up going and, I don't know, winning the national championship and then being the number one overall pick in the National Football League. And now doing very well in the National Football League. Yeah, in fact, just picked up his uh, first win as an NFL starting quarterback a week ago. Now, he's not saying that that Zach Wilson is going to be the number one pick in the NFL draft. That's right. not what he's saying. But he's saying that type of leap is what he's seeing from Zach Wilson. That is extremely positive and, and um, honestly, it's just a massive compliment and a massive comment from a niche about Zach Wilson. Yeah, that that is incredible. He Zach Wilson is getting so much national attention and Man, you gotta you gotta credit the offensive line because they are giving Zach Wilson so much time. They are giving him a lot of time, and when he has that much time, he's he's throwing dimes. You know, he's he's fantastic. So again, the schedule kind of lends itself to having a great season when you're already a very talented quarterback. And, and I'll hand it to him; he's he's fantastic so i'm excited to see when he when he gets more pressure on him which honestly utsa jeff grimes said their defensive line is probably their strongest defensive position right. this could be a decent test we'll see uh for zach wilson to get a little more pressure on him to see if he can continue with that insane completion percentage cuz i like i like the hype i i buy into it to an extent i think he's very talented but uh I'm excited to see 
what he can do with a little pressure on him when he has to use his legs a little more and still find those open receivers. Yeah, I mean, not only has he not been sacked, he hasn't been touched. Yeah. The, the offensive line yeah, they, they are has, has kept every defense away from even touching Zach Wilson this year. And look, I, I agree with you in terms of BYU not being totally tested. But here's my counter to that to a certain degree. I just don't know many times where anybody's had an 85% completion percentage it's true. regardless of who they're playing and over three games. Totally. Now, you can have yep. that for a game, maybe two, but he has it through three games, and if it, if it continues, you're talking about almost half of your season, You know, getting close to half of your season with a completion percentage that high. The, the throws he's making and the way he's doing it I, I think almost supersedes the competition. When you're being that efficient, it, it, it's not about the competition. It's about what he's doing. And I agree. I think when you get into, you know, when, we, when we're doing the show next week about Houston, mm-hmm. you know, it'll be a little different. Yeah. Because now I don't expect Houston to be world beater, but but they they will be better than some of these other teams. And yeah. then certainly when you get into November and you have that first game, the November 7th at Boise, those are going to be your bigger tests. Right. But right now, what Zach Wilson's doing is is remarkable. I mean, the guy is so confident. His demeanor, when you watch him on the field, it looks like he's just playing catch with his guys for fun. Like, his demeanor is so calm and confident. And I know that helps the confidence of the rest of his, his team as well. So I hope if he gets a little bit scrambled and maybe beat up just a hair in some of these upcoming games, I hope he can keep that confidence and I think he will he's a confident guy but but I hope that part of him continues because I think that has really benefited him a lot because he's like hey I'm just playing catch with the guys that's what it looks like when he's out there on the field it looks effortless and obviously he's trying to help his team get to four and oh for the first time since when Lauren since 2014, oh, ship, we bring up that year, and it really it started out so it well. does weird things <laughs> for me, my emotions, because that was such a fun, exciting year with Taysom Hill as a starting quarterback, and he was in the he was in the Heisman talk. I don't know if you remember that year. Absolutely, I remember. And, uh, of course you do. Of course you remember. But it oh, it just was such a fun year to cover BYU, and they looked so good and strong until. Game number five against stinking Utah State when Taysom Hill gets injured, and then it kind of all went downhill from there. Yeah, they won four in a row to start the year, and then once Taysom went down, they lost four in a row. Yeah, I know. Well, he was he was the guy. He was the leader. He was everything to them, and and then uh, it, it tanked. So, so hopefully, fingers crossed, nothing like that happens to Zach Wilson. I think that's going to be one of the keys, obviously, is keeping Zach Wilson healthy throughout the the rest of the season if they want to continue what they're doing right now. Not that the backup quarterbacks aren't proven. That's actually one of the differences, I feel like, from 2014. Is these Baylor's quarter- already proven he He's proven win. himself. He can come in, and, and they may not miss very much of a beat, but that wasn't the case in 2014. But that is a difference this year. But I feel like BYU does need Zach Wilson if they want to win out for the rest of the season. Should we focus a little bit more on, uh, on UT... I keep wanting to say UT San Antonio. Maybe I'm mean, like a hybrid of UTSA yeah, and all right. University of Texas San mind. Antonio. I'm sure they're fine with it. Um, <laughs> do you know where they play their home games? Obviously, this is a game at Lavelle Edwards Stadium, but do you know where they play their home games? They play the Al. Al- oh my gosh! Excuse they me. They play the at Alamo the Alamo. Dome. They do. They play inside the Alamo in the basement. <laughs> That's how small the school there. Right next to Pee Wee's <laughs> yes. bike, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and you know what? In, in fact, so yes, they played the Alamo Dome. Uh, you heard uh, our producer, Cole Wissinger, uh, chiming in on that. So you've, you've kind of compiled a list of and, – and for those that don't know the Alamo Dome, um, for a long, long time, that's where the San Antonio Spurs played once the Alamo Dome first opened up. But it, it's essentially a football stadium. It's been the home of the Final Four a few yes. times. Like, they stick a basketball – court in the middle of it, but it's a huge football stadium. It's where the Alamo Bowl is played Correct. every single d- December or January, whenever bowl season happens. This year, maybe August? <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> but you've compiled a list of some of the, the biggest, the smallest, some of the oldest um, you stadiums, know, stadiums mm-hmm. in college football. Oh, yeah, because the Alamo Dome, I recognized, but I didn't realize it was in constant use and, in fact, against uh, it, for the team that we're playing this week. And so I started looking at the different stadiums. The big ones are ones that you will recognize from the Big Ten and the SEC. You got Michigan, Penn State, Ohio State. 
Texas A&M, their 12th man, right? Don't tell the Seattle Seahawks fans <laughs> or anything. But in College Station, that's one of the biggest stadiums. And then a stadium BYU was familiar with just last year. The fifth biggest is Neyland Stadium for the University of Tennessee. Mm, which I was just there. Yes. By the way, I was there. I saw uh, the pictures. Yes, last week, and, and I got a, a tour of Neyland Stadium, and it is. Really? I did. That campus is just beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful campus. Look, I, I've only been to Nashville. Uh, okay. I have not been anywhere beyond that. We had the Fan Fest a couple years ago in yeah. Nashville. I loved it. I absolutely loved Nashville. It, honestly, it reminded me a lot of, of growing up in Missouri. Um, very very similar in terms of you know the way mm-hmm. things looked, and obviously you have the humidity and things like that. But I loved it. But Knoxville is a place I'd love oh, to go check Knox- out. Knoxville phenomenal. And I tweeted this out, but honestly, I so my husband's family is from Tennessee, and we were watching. We watched the Tennessee game, then we watched the BYU game, BYU football game right after. <laughs> they they did not like they they still remember obviously that game from last year, <laughs> sure. and they are holding on to it just like BYU fan the diehard BYU fans would do. You know when they lost to somebody, but they could barely even talk about the game. They 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 were just like let's let's move on. They did you know, turn I don't, I don't things around though after BYU. that game, yeah, which is kind of cool because then you can root for them. Now that you've beat them, now you like oh now yeah. you can have your success. No exactly because we've already we've already got our win. What else you got, Cole, in terms of uh, stadiums? So as you roll down like the list of capacity, you get to a lot of the stadiums that share their tenant with the NFL teams. So like the the stadium down in Miami, mm-hmm. it's the Dolphins and the Hurricanes, right? Uh, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, the new Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas is the home of the Raiders and the UNLV running Rebels. And kind of BYU because we know that they <laughs> Cougar fans will fill that thing up when BYU oh, plays UNLV down there. You bet they, and then that capacity is right around where we see the Alamo Dome and Lavelle Edwards Stadium at about 63, 65,000. At much less than that, you have some of the smallest stadiums. And UTSA is one of the newer teams to FBS, as we learned with Stephanie Cisneros. And some of those other new teams are what have some of the smaller stadiums. A couple that are familiar to BYU's schedule, UMass, uh, when they're not playing in Gillette Stadium, right. which Home BYU the is there. Uh, they have Warren Mc- McGuirk Alumni Stadium. <laughs> Which has when you a can't pronounce it, that's a bad sign. That it's really small. Seventeen thousand. Seventeen thousand. Oh, not great for our independent ally, uh, the UMass. Hey, at least they Minutemen. just scheduled their first game. They decided to, they they decided to change course. Decided they will play, and then nobody would schedule them. They got one game this week. That's it. <laughs> one game is their season. <laughs> if they're one and zero, are they bowl eligible? True. That's undefeated. Hey, that's actually undefeated a great season. point. They would they would put up a banner with an undefeated season. I want to know. And then another <laughs> an opponent later this year for BYU Western Kentucky, another one of the smaller stadiums, just over twenty thousand or so. Well, this year it doesn't really matter, <laughs> right? Yeah. Thanks, Cole. Great stuff. Uh, before we take a break. Navy jerseys. Yeah, let, uh, BYU's let's talk going about with those. the Navy jersey Ooh. against UTSA. Your thoughts? Which not not a lot of people are a fan of the Navy jerseys. BYU is dominated in the Royal. Everyone loves the Royal, wants it to come back permanently. Yes. Why why is BYU switching up? I understand. You got you got to use what you got. That's one of the traditional colors. But supposedly the players are, we are the ones that make this decision. Yep. No, really? Apparently, that's what I saw. Somebody tweeted it out and I think it was I think it was Billy from BYU Equipment was asked how they uh, how they decided decide on it? Who, how they decide and I'm the pretty, players want I'm it pretty sure that it's the, the players Navy? that decide what they want. But I'm with, uh, you. I'm, oh, with hey, you. I'm okay with it if the players decide it. Well, but I'm I'm still like, look, I'm not saying that BYU is not going to beat UTSA <laughs> because they're wearing navy. But I'd just rather keep the mojo in the Royal and just keep it rolling. Yeah, because if you don't look good, you don't feel good. You know? <laughs> look, okay. And here's, but they do look good. They, they look fantastic. Here's my question to you. All Royal, or do you like the Royal tops with the blue pants or vice versa? Or do you like Royal top, Royal pants? Which we, we, we've seen both versions. Yes, I like, I like Royal top, white pants. I, I'm with you. Yes, I do. It's, it's my favorite of all of them. Those just look sleek. It yes. just looks Except so good on Utah the Utah week. Where I love the look of all blue and then all versus red. all red. That is cool. Mm. Yeah, but I, I do it, like that they've gone with that, that that's the thing, that regardless of whether it's a home or away, you wear your yeah. your blue and you wear your red. Yep. I, I like that for that. That's pretty cool. And I'm not going to be superstitious. I, I think they're going to do phenomenal in whatever color jersey they're wearing. The look of it is my favorite, but... But let's do it anyway. If the players want it, I want it. Let's yeah, go. Th- yeah, they're going to wear navy. They'll still roll in the game. I I would certainly expect. But I I do like the I do like the royal. And I wonder eventually if if that's. I mean, you don't have to make a 
a color change because it's already in your color scheme. Right. You can already but I just wonder if eventually to the point I was wondering if they were going to just continue to wear royal all year because they the first 3 games it was royal I'm like well, maybe they're just going to wear royal all year long. Yeah. Well that that got answered when they said they were going to wear navy today. Well I wouldn't have hated that but so today they're wearing navy. It's also homecoming and who knows what they're going to be doing in the stadium but we want to figure that out. So coming up we're going to be talking to David Almadova who's the BYU director of marketing for BYU Athletics. So don't go anywhere. This is Cougar Tailgate. Did you know the first coach in Roadrunner history was former national champion Larry Coker? To the Cougar Tailgate. My name is Jason Shepard. And I'm Lauren McLean. While BYU was bowling over the competition on the field, Cosmo the Cougar was doing a little bowling of his own. <laughs> it was pretty. That was pretty good, though, no, by seriously, the way. It, That's fun. it was. It was really fun to watch. Really weird with no fans in the stands, but <laughs> I liked it from home. Cosmo took advantage of the empty stands to roll down in a giant orb over the seats and down to knock over some bowling pins in the south end zone during a timeout in the game on Saturday. Cosmo is always up to something to keep fans engaged, even if it's over social media instead of the game. And outreach to fans and the game day experience is probably the most unique it's ever been. And we have BYU's Associate Athletic Director over Marketing and Promotions, David Almodova, with us to talk about what they've got up their sleeve. Welcome back to Cougar Tailgate, David. Thank you. Glad, glad being with you guys. We love having you on. And, and so this year has been absolutely crazy. Can you just summarize for us how crazy it has been and how flexible you and your staff have to be with everything going on? You know what? We're, we're still trying to, to figure it out as we go. Um, <laughs> obviously, this whole thing hit months ago, and, and we're in this process of trying to adapt and trying to innovate and trying to use uh, technology at its finest. Um, obviously part of our responsibility is to, to connect and engage with our fans. And quite frankly, obviously, you know, everybody knows we haven't had fans at the stadium. And so, you know, we've implemented a few things. Uh, one of those things has been a virtual Cougar walk. So for fans who are listening, if you haven't been able to, um, it's something that we have done the last uh, two weekends and we've had a great response from Cougar nation, uh, to jump on that and welcome the team to the stadium. Um, so that's kind of been a fun thing uh, to work on and, and to see the fans at home uh, with their Cougar gear on and, and cheering on the team as they enter the stadium, getting ready for their game. And so that was something that we had to, you know, really adjust and adapt. Um, obviously Cosmo last week at the game rolling down with no fans. We couldn't do that obviously with fans, but um, <laughs> you, could, but you might have some lawsuits on your hand. Yeah. And that was my thing. I said, Hey, this is awesome that he wants to do this. Let's just make sure we have an ambulance on site ready. <laughs> just in case. Hey, here's my question, David. Did it, did you or anybody within the athletic department get to try that out first? Did anybody at least want to try that out? Not anybody with a right head on their shoulders. <laughs> um, a couple people did. and But what I was told is Cosmo did practice that a, a bunch of times. So they assured me that he was safe and protected. So obviously that's what we want in the end. Well, you had mentioned the the Cougar Walk, and and last year, now I wasn't part of this show last year, but I know that you were on this program talking with Lauren before you guys launched Cougar Canyon last year, and I think Cougar Canyon is fantastic. Last year, that's where I was able to do radio pregame, so I got to experience that for the first couple of hours before the game started, and the Cougar Walk was obviously a big part of that, and you've mentioned that it's it's gone virtual. How do fans get involved in that virtual Cougar Walk? Yeah, so we will send out a link every week uh, through all of our social platforms. Uh, We also sent out a Cougar mail uh, that went out this past weekend. So fans can just click on the link and go and sign up, and they'll get a notification or an email response on game day uh, with directions on how to jump on that. And so um, it's been good. I think fans have enjoyed it. And last week we'd had a little – we brought in hashtag I am Jack the Mooney uh, to engage <laughs> oh, no. with our fans while they were waiting for the team, and we gave away prizes. And so we're planning to do that again for the game this Saturday. That guy, that guy is meant to be a social media personality. Just he needs to shine. He needs to be the star of his own show. So another thing that you guys have done is the second screen feature during games. Without fans, at least for right now, what are some other things that the marketing department is looking forward to doing to involve fans during games? 
Right. So we've, we've created the second screen experience. So obviously fans can connect and watch uh, to see what Cougar Nation is talking about through the social media platforms. Um, so whether you're watching on Facebook Live or Twitter or Instagram, uh, fans can watch, you know, the pregame on what's going on in the stadium, basically watching our guys warm up, uh, team run out and different things like that. And then we've got a live shot, a uh, live video shot on Greg Rebell as he's calling the game. So for fans who want to not only listen to Greg, but actually see Greg, uh, they can do that. <laughs> Just something that we're continuing to adapt on, obviously, as we go throughout the season. Um, again, we've had to pivot really quickly because at one point we were going to have fans and we we're preparing for fans. And then a few days later, we're told no fans. And so just having to pivot um, quickly. And so, you know, our hope is that we'll be able to get some fans in, but we're still talking about fans or no fans and what we can do. So we're still working on that second screen experience for fans who obviously are at home watching the game. Well, even though at least for right now, actual fans are not allowed in the stadium, there are some cardboard cutouts of fans. And I know um, that that's, in fact, one of my one of my little kids, as soon as he saw that, like immediately he's like, Dad, I want to do that. I want to do that. Who, who do you, Who's in charge of all the card? Is that you? Because honestly, David, Lauren and I are just kind of wanting to know how we get one. <laughs> We're, we're going to be honest here. It's in front row, preferably. <laughs> yeah, so we started that, you know, obviously when we, again, we were told no fans, we, again, had to pivot really quick, and we decided to put, you know, cardboard cutouts on sale where fans can upload an image of themselves. Um, so we thought we'd start with some of our BYU alums and some BYU celebrities, and we've had quite a few fans who have purchased. We had a lot more fans purchased that will go in for this Saturday and for the rest of the season. So our plan with that is to have – uh, to give those back to them when the season ends, kind of a momento from the season. Um, it's got a lot of airtime. It's been really fun to just listen to commentators talking about it and other people. So, yeah, it's been a good thing. Again, something that we just had to pivot on really quickly. Um, so I think fans have enjoyed it. We, there's been some really cool stories come out of it uh, from people who have submitted their images. So it's been great to just see those stories and read those stories about some of the people that are that are in there. And you can still get those cardboard cutouts right now if, if you're interested in in ordering more. Is that correct? That is correct. But we will probably what we'll do is we're going to after this week, we will then determine how it went and where we are. You know, hopefully we can learn if hopefully we will have fans for the next game. Um, but obviously we'll, it won't be a sellout or nothing. So we want to continue to have this, you know, be a part of our, our in-game experience, have the cardboard cutouts in there. I, I've also been uh, having some fun with the, the celebrities that have been in there in terms of the cutouts. You know, you've had a couple of the celebrities that have had some fun with it. I know Mitt Romney had commented about it. Danny Ainge. Uh, Danny Ainge. Yeah. Marie Osmond talked about how much fun she had at the uh, BYU game. <laughs> so I think it's fun that they're having fun with it as well. Absolutely. And, you know, we, you know, ESPN called us this last week to ask us about it and talk about it because they game day, college game day did a, a special on the cardboard cutouts throughout the country <laughs> and showed some stories behind the scenes. So that's been really, really fun to see uh, what schools are doing. Um, but yeah, it's just, again, just trying to figure out different ways to, to incorporate fans without having them in the venue, if that makes sense. Yeah, you, you mentioned some of the things that other schools are doing uh, apart from BYU, and I know you keep in contact with some of those other programs. What are some of the coolest things that you've seen across the sports world from a marketing standpoint during this super unique time in sports? You know, to be honest, one thing that has been a challenge was our first game and trying to create somewhat of an ambient crowd noise. Hmm. Um, and so that was actually – I talked to counterparts across the country – who had already played games and they just kept saying, Dave, it's going to be eerie. It's different. It's weird. And so trying to figure out, okay, how do we incorporate some of our traditional chants that we do at games, some of the traditional cheers, um, and then just having that crowd noise and where we can have that from a decibel level that both teams agree on. So that's kind of been a challenging, but then cool thing to kind of go back and, and look at and see, okay, how do we, how do we make this happen during a live game? Um, obviously when crowd, when the crowd is there, they can help ignite and, you know, our team while they're on the sideline getting ready for plays or whatnot. And so there's been times where we've had to say, Hey, we got to throw a certain song up or do something with the video board. Cause there's not a lot of energy going on right now. So how do we crank that up? And so that's kind of just been a challenge, but then something cool to do, um, just to kind of, again, help with the game day atmosphere within the venue with no fans in there. 
Well, and, and David, you obviously know this better than anybody. Fan interaction and fan engagement is fantastic, and it's even better when you've got a really good team to cheer for, and that's exactly what we have with this Cougar football team this year, 3-0, and playing such good football. I, I, I've got to imagine, beyond all of the, of the stuff that you have to do to get ready for these games, it's probably just fun for you watching this team out there right now because they're killing it. It's been really exciting, and again, it just it breaks my heart because we can't have you know players' families. We can't have our fans and people that just want to be in that stadium and cheering on our team. I mean, what a time to be watching BYU football when they are rolling on both sides of the ball and we can't have people in there. It's just wild. And so I ache, I ache for the families. I ache for the fans who can't be in there and just hoping that, you know, at some point in the season, we'll be able to have them come in and, and cheer on the Cougs. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a they're definitely being vocal on on social media how much they want to be in the game. So hopefully they can get that done soon. So David, how can fans stay up to date with everything that your team is doing, and just stay connected with the team and other fans while they can't get together in person? Sure. You know, for right now we're just we're doing a lot on our social media platforms. Um, Stuart Call, who does a great job with our with our social media team, uh, they're just putting out a lot of content throughout the week on game day. Um, you know, it's great to have the partnership we do with BYU TV. Obviously, we have a one hour countdown to kickoff show and a post game show. And so, you know, fans can really, you know, see what's happening before the game um, and listen to those guys talking about the game. Um, and honestly, just through our social platforms, that's that's one way just to stay connected. Um, we're trying to do a lot of different things through those platforms. And so we hope that fans will engage uh, with that. You know, we've also had to, another thing that we've missed is not having the band and cheer and cougarettes. Um, they're a big part of what we do on game day from an entertainment standpoint. And so we've had the, you know, video record them and show them, you know, during the game on those platforms uh, for fans to see them perform. And so that's just been, you know, the college football game day feel is is not what it usually is. And, and they are big components of that. And so, Again, just keep trying to adjust, and we again hoping that at some point this year we can have them in there. That's cer- that's certainly the hope for sure. David, as as one of the very few people who actually get to be on the field during the home football games, what what is the feeling like when just when it's so quiet? Like when BYU scores a touchdown, what does that feel like? It's eerie. It's weird. It's I mean, like I'm excited, and I. And I give the fist pumps, but, you know, and, and you hear, you know, we, we crank in the crowd noise for those few seconds that we can. And then you look at down the sideline and you see the team cheering and, and that's it. I mean, you just, you, you don't hear the roar. You don't hear, you know, the crowd noise. And, and so it's just, it's weird. I mean, again, it's just, it's so exciting to watch our team play and perform the way they are. But on the other side, it's just, on the other hand, it's just, it's really weird. It's really eerie. It's just different. David, thank you so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate it. Um, You and your team, as always, do a fantastic job. And I know, as you mentioned, a lot of flexibility and and just kind of going um, with with the situation. You guys have done a fantastic job, and uh, we know uh, that will certainly continue regardless of the scenarios playing forward. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. You're awesome, David. Thanks. That was David Almadova, the Associate Athletic Director of Marketing for BYU. He's an incredible guy. I love David. David's a great guy. And, you know, he, he talked about it. There's, there's nothing you can plan for because, you know, you thought you were going to have fans and then you don't. And so you have to pivot and immediately go with, with some alternate plans because even though it was only going to be 6,000 originally, that, that's still 6,000 fans that were going to be there. And so you had, you had plans for that scenario. Now, you obviously have contingency plans along the way, but to, to, to pivot from one to the other just like that, oh, yeah. that you've, you've got to be on your toes. And they, his, David and his team do a fantastic job. And he's like, you know what? Let's just throw Cosmo <laughs> into a bubble Here's and my question. send him down the stadium. Maybe not right now, <laughs> but would you do that? 
What do you mean, Shep? Not right now. <laughs> I mean, with child. Um, I actually, listen, maybe back in back in the old days, back in my early 20s, I'd probably do it. But it, it actually did look like a lot of fun. If I knew that I was going to be safe at the end and there was an ambulance standing by, yeah. <laughs> like David said, I would do it. Would you do it? Uh, probably not. <laughs> I am not what you would call adventurous. <laughs> um, so you look, applaud those look, that are. I would. I don't have a problem getting in the said orb. Uh, I don't mind getting in it, but the being pushed down the Lavelle Edwards Stadium stairs is the part that I'm not too keen on. If you were guaranteed to go social media, you know, get huge on social media trending, would you do it? You know what? I could probably be talked into it. Yes. No, Even though you're you. completely safe and, and and whatnot, as safe as you can be in a ball rolling down the stands. <laughs> but yeah, I know. Well, he has a very padded suit. He had a padded suit, so I'm sure that contributed. Well, anyway, we had a great show. We did. David was fantastic. We talked to Stephanie Cisneros. She's the associate athletic director for UTSA. Let us know some of the traditions and insights into the Roadrunners, and, and that was fantastic. And and here we go, man. Game day. Yeah, another another game. You know what? And and I think I say this every week. Just the fact that we've made it to another game week is a win. Regardless of the outcome, it is a win with, with so many unknowns. The fact that we've made it another week BYU's playing another game. That is a win regardless of the outcome, even though we all know what the outcome's going to (laughs) be. So true. We're not going to say it. It's going to be a blowout. We all know that. And it's homecoming. Happy homecoming, everybody. Absolutely. What a a weird homecoming, huh? Yes. Hey, they get out of the bus. Ah! (laughs) Like, hey, where is everybody? No one's here. All right, guys, thanks for listening. You can join the Cougar Tailgate virtually, of course, every Saturday at noon, Mountain Time, or download, rate, and review our podcast wherever you get podcasts. Apple, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, or on BYUradio.org. There's another Texas school on the horizon for next Friday in Houston. But right now, it's UTSA. This is Cougar Tailgate.